So we finished with the various parts of the brain. Now we're going to describe each part. So the first one we are going to describe is the cerebral hemispheres. There are two of them. Uh, also known as the cerebrum. And you notice that in all of these slides, I give you what the cavity which is present related to those areas are. So it's a good idea to, that's why I take pictures of these PowerPoint slides and keep looking at them on your phone or something, you know, make flashcards. Uh, so you can see the cavity of the cerebral hemisphere is the lateral ventricle, okay? Now these two hemispheres, um, if you look at the two hemispheres, so if you see from the top, if you're looking at it, here's one cerebral hemisphere and here's another cerebral hemisphere. In between, the two hemispheres are separated by a sort of little groove, which is known as the longitudinal fissure. And the two cerebral hemispheres, it's not like they're completely separate. They're actually connected to each other deep inside. If you were to kind of open the cerebral hemispheres a little, you'll notice that deep inside they are connected to each other by a band of white matter, which is known as the corpus callosum, okay? And if we go back to this previous image here, so, and I draw it, so this is one cerebral hemisphere you can see, and the other cerebral hemisphere would have been here like ah. this. Okay, I can't hear. I, I didn't hear anything, so I guess you, you 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 heard something. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. Okay. Let me. See. Let's see. Okay. Oh yeah, it does. Okay, let me do one thing. Um, I don't think I have a video. Let me take this out here. Okay, let's see. And I need to increase my volume a little bit more then. So if you look at this picture, so imagine if I drew the other cerebral hemisphere here like this, okay? Um, so you would so here in between the two would be the longitudinal fissure, right? Between the two. And connecting the two cerebral hemispheres is this band of white matter which we call corpus callosum. So if I now remove this cerebral hemisphere here, you can see this corpus callosum. This this is the band which has kind of been cut this way, okay? So if we go to the next picture, and here's where I was drawing it. So you see the two cerebral hemispheres on either side, if you're looking at it from the top. So this is the band which connects the two across, and this is known as corpus callosum. The other important thing about the hemisphere is that each hemisphere controls the contralateral, means the opposite side of the body. So impulses from your right side, sensory impulses from the right side will travel to the left cerebral hemisphere. So if I was to say that this is one cerebral hemisphere, the impulses from this side of the body will go here. And this side will, remember, sensory impulses go towards the central nervous system. We talked about it, and motor impulses come down from the central nervous system. So any impulse coming from this cerebrum will go, can you see, to the opposite side of the body. So if there was a damage to this cerebral hemisphere, you will see that the opposite side of the body would be affected. Okay, so that's what is meant by contralateral. Yes. Can you create synapses? On the other side of the brain, though? That's, uh, well, that's why you have that corpus callosum, because the corpus callosum, and I think I mentioned this earlier, the corpus callosum helps to transfer information from one side to the other. So normally one area of the brain is dominant for any one function, but if that area is damaged because of this constant transfer of information, there may be parts which can learn to pick up on what was lost. <coughs> No, I didn't stop recording, no, yeah. Um, then the surface of the cerebral hemisphere is also thrown into a lot of grooves, and those grooves are known as sulci. And in between, you can see here are these sulci. And in between those grooves, you have an area of raised tissue, which is known as a gyrus, which is like a ridge. Singular is gyrus, plural is gyri. 
the cerebral hemispheres are also divided into four main lobes. We'll be talking about those lobes. Uh, some books uh, give another fifth lobe known as the insula, which is kind of a little bit hidden, but otherwise we have four main lobes. We'll talk about those four main lobes. And those lobes are named based on the cranial bones that they are related to. Another very important thing that is there in the cerebral hemispheres and which is shown in this part over here and again when we go to those lobes I will draw it again. The body is represented in an upside down fashion. So if you look at the at one if I was to draw a cerebral one of the hemispheres from the side and let's say that this area is called the motor area we'll go over that. So normally you would expect that the body would be represented, you know, in a straight erect form like this with the head being there and the legs being here. But that's not how it is. The, the head is here and then the legs kind of go down. The body is represented in an upside down fashion. So if this area was damaged, the head would be, muscles of the head would be damaged. If this area was damaged, maybe muscles of the thigh would be damaged, okay? Another very important thing is, and as you can see from this picture, notice how they have drawn this picture. The, see the face is drawn so big, look at the mouth is so big, look at the area for the tongue, um, look at the thumb and the hand. But can you see the leg? In our body our legs are a lot larger than the face and the hands, right? So the representation on the surface of the hemisphere like on the surface of the cerebral hemisphere, each part has a certain area given to it. Uh, the representation is not based on size but more on functional importance. If you look at it in your hand, your thumb is the most important digit because if you take your thumb away, you will be not, a, you won't be able to grip or do anything properly. Okay, so thumb is really, really important. Similarly, in the mouth, the tongue is very important because it's used for speaking. It's used for, um, you know, uh, swallowing. So you can see for eating. So it's extremely important. So that's why functionally it's a lot more important maybe than your foot. All the foot does is plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, right? So can you see that it's got a greater area of representation? So that's very important for you to know that the area represented is more on functional importance rather than size. Now here are some gross features of the cerebrum and I use the word gross features is something that you can see with your naked eye. So here's a sagittal section, the same section we saw um, over there and here's like a coronal or could be even a horizontal section. So the gray matter in the cerebrum is on the outside, it is known as the cortex. The white matter is in the center up here. And then there are islands of gray matter. Can you see this drawn in these different colors, the pink and the purple? This blue is, are the cavities, but this purple and this pink. So these islands of gray matter are known as nucleus or nuclei are also called basal ganglia. They have different names. So notice the word um, over here, nucleus. Can you see caudate nucleus and thalamus and uh, putal caudate nucleus, you know? Uh, if you remember, when we looked at terms in neuroanatomy, remember wherever there was a collection of nerve cell bodies, we called it cortex or gray matter or nucleus. So here you have nerve cell bodies. And remember I gave you that example. Nerve cell bodies were like a bunch of flowers. The flower heads together and the stems we called as, as the uh, axons and they were called white matter or tracts or nerve. Uh, so in the nucleus, you have multipolar neuron cell bodies. Remember, multipolar neurons were found in the central nervous system. So this is a review. And here is a cut section of the corpus callosum up here. And this is a band of white matter which connects the two hemispheres and it allows transfer of information from one hemisphere to the other. Your PowerPoint slides, as I said earlier, are really good review slides. You know, they kind of put everything in a nutshell. Okay, so be sure to look at everything really carefully. And I have all of these kind of boxed in, which just shows you that pay attention to some of these terms up here. Even cortex should have been boxed in here, cerebral cortex, because, you know, that tells you that, that it's present on the outside. Now here are some sulci and gyri and how do we tell the lobes of the cerebrum. Some important sulci that you should know. The first one is that longitudinal fissure. It's not called the sulcus. It's called the fissure. They mean the same thing. 
So it was between the two cerebral hemispheres. So again, if I drew the other cerebral hemisphere here like this, right, you can understand that this part here would be the fissure between the two. When you go to the uh, lab, you can see the fissure between the two hemispheres is called the longitudinal fissure. And then we have a transverse fissure, which is this one here, which separates, as you can see, the cerebral hemisphere above from the cerebellum below. So this fissure here, so you can actually lift the cerebral hemisphere up and you'll see the cerebellum below. So this is the transverse fissure. Then you have a few important sulci which help you to tell which, how you identify the lobes of the brain. Remember I said there were four main lobes of the cerebrum. So one sulcus or one fissure is what is called the central sulcus. As the name suggests, it's somewhere in the middle, almost the middle of the cerebrum. So this is the longest uninterrupted sulcus along the middle of the cerebral hemisphere. So you can see it comes vertically below. And then we have another sulcus which is going horizontally across this one, which is called the lateral sulcus. Okay. So here is the central sulcus and here is the lateral sulcus. And then we have another sulcus which actually begins on the medial side. So this begins on the medial side here. And this sulcus you can see a little bit on the lateral aspect here which is called the parieto-occipital sulcus. So this one which is, which I've drawn here, the parieto-occipital sulcus. And there is a little notch. If you were to draw the cerebrum and look at the cerebrum, so up here you kind of draw it straight like that and we come to the lower part of the cerebrum notice it kind of goes up a little so if I was to kind of delineate this so notice it kind of it goes up a little and then comes like this so can you see this little area here which is notched this notch is called the pre-occipital notch okay so how do we now differentiate because on the brain there aren't, it isn't written, this is the frontal lobe, this is the temporal, and neither are the brain's lobes colored, right? So we have to find a way to make landmarks and say how we differentiate the lobes. So what we can see is the central sulcus comes down and kind of joins this lateral sulcus. Here's this little parieto-occipital sulcus, and here was that pre-occipital notch that I was talking about. So I'm going to just erase, erase this. So here's that pre-occipital notch. Here's the parieto-occipital sulcus. Here's the central sulcus joining this lateral sulcus. If we take this lateral sulcus further forward and join, make an arbitrary line joining this parieto-occipital down to this pre-occipital notch and push this forward, can you see now we have four lobes that we can see? Okay, and that's how the lobes are formed. So we kind of artificially form them. So in front of the central sulcus, you will notice this frontal lobe. So here's the central sulcus. In front of it is the frontal lobe. Behind the central sulcus and in front of this pre-occipital, sul parieto-occipital sulcus is this parietal lobe. Below this lateral sulcus is this temporal lobe. So this was frontal, this was parietal, this is temporal lobe, you can see here. And behind this artificial line is this occipital lobe. So I want you to know just how these uh, lobes have been delineated. So you're using, what are you using? You're using the central sulcus, you're using the lateral sulcus, and a line joining this preoccipital notch to the parieto-occipital. And you join all of them and you get these four lobes, okay? M there are many of these little ridges which you can see, which we call gyri. Two important ones that I want you to remember are one in front of the central sulcus and one behind the central sulcus. The one in front will be called pre-central gyrus, pre meaning in front of. The one behind is called post-central gyrus, right? So pre-central sulcus belongs to which lobe by looking at the picture? Frontal, very good. Post-central belongs to which sulcus? Parietal. Okay. 
We were talking, remember, we talked of sensations and I said, you know, touch, temperature, pain, if you got pricked somewhere and you all of this happened, remember all those sensations went to your brain? They finally get processed in this post-central gyrus. So this post-central gyrus is important for perceiving general sensations such as your touch, temperature, pain, pressure. And we remember we said sensations go towards the CNS, right? Afferent fibers or sensory fibers or sensory impulses go towards the central nervous system. Then we talked about motor impulses. And we said motor impulses come down from the central nervous system and then they will go to muscle. And we were talking about skeletal muscle, right? Because we are doing the, say, the voluntary system. So from this pre-central gyrus, from this area, fibers will come down. There will be motor fibers they will come down and they'll go all the way as tracks and they will finally, you know, go to the spinal cord and then another neuron will go out and they will send impulses to skeletal muscle. So as just as this was responsible for sensation, pre-central gy gyrus is responsible for voluntary motor activity. So when we discuss functions of the lobes, you will see that I will mention this again. But right here, you may want to write it down. So pre-central gyrus, which is part of the frontal lobe for motor activity, it controls voluntary motor activity. Post-central gyrus in the parietal lobe receives or perceives sensations. There was another lobe, remember I mentioned, called the insula. Normally we talk mainly of these four lobes. The insula is a deep lobe buried inside. So if I kind of lifted this parietal and frontal lobe up and I pulled the temporal lobe below deep inside here I would see the insula it's kind of buried inside okay now let's look at the functional areas in the lobes what each lobe is responsible for this is something that you must know there's no good way of remembering it so I would just say is take or pictures of this slide and just on your phones or you know make a little uh, print these slides separately make little flashcards and keep looking at them over and over again okay so the frontal lobe which is in front of the central sulcus as I told you just now the pre-central gyrus this is the motor cortex which controls voluntary movement so impulses will begin from there and they will go all the way down to the spinal cord and then the anterior horn cells will send off nerve fibers, motor neurons, so it controls that. In front of that motor cortex, so the area in front of the motor cortex, this area in front of the motor cortex is called pre-motor, pre-meaning in front of. This is responsible for planning and doing complex tasks, skilled motor activity, you know, things like uh, you're buttoning up your shirt, you're also, you know, doing something else side by side, you're pouring tea or, you know, doing all that. So skilled motor activity, a lot, which requires a lot of computation in your head. There's another area in the, in the frontal lobe called the Broca's area, which is responsible for motor speech. Motor speech means the very act of talking. If this area is gone, you won't be able to talk. You'll understand everything that a person is saying, but you will not be able to articulate your words properly. So the way you will talk is if this thing is gone and you ask me my, my name, I know what I want to say, but I'm not able to say it properly. The area is gone. Either I won't be able to say it at all or I will say, but then I take that. You see that? You see how I'm talking? I'm not talking properly, so I don't... As far as you're concerned, I don't make sense. But in my head, I'm saying everything properly. Okay? You had a question? Yes. Um, in two instances, I have a question. Like with autism, is that something that has possibly happened to that um, part of the brain? Is no. Autism is, um, uh, it, 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 uh, it's not necessarily just the frontal part. It could be a lot of other areas. Usually, these diseases are when the connections between the various parts are not working properly. Because, you know, uh, in autism, a lot of it is uh, they tend to be kind of a little bit closed in like this. You know, so, some things come well to them, some things don't. So connections are not made properly. It's a little bit more complicated of just saying that the frontal lobe is not developed properly. So what about the stroke? The stroke? Well, a stroke could happen anywhere. If a stroke happens, stroke is basically like a brain attack. So where either there's a hemorrhage in the brain or the blood supply to a part of the brain is gone. If it's gone, if the part, the motor cortex is gone, the person's voluntary movement on the opposite side of the body will go. So it's like that. Okay. Is it like a the, the brain and the mouth are connecting 
that that's uh, that is in motor speech. Okay, so let's not bring too many terms in. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says that it affects the speech, and it sounds like nonsense. To us who don't have an injury, does the person who has the injury not hear what they're saying? In the well, they may hear. They they just they can't speak. It, it's imagine if I tied up your tongue, you can't talk. So they 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 know what they want to say. They just cannot bring it out. I mean, and when I say nonsense, means you know that they have a speech impediment. So you might think they have a speech problem, and later you'll realize that it is uh, probably because that area is gone. Okay. So, but they know that they have... Yeah, they problems. know that, yeah. Right. Then the area in front is called the prefrontal cortex, um, before the Broca's area. So prefrontal is this area up here, okay? Prefrontal, right in the front up here. So that area is to do a lot with intellect, judgment, social inhibitions. Um, you know, judgment becomes very important. The free, prefrontal, you know, the very fact that you decide to take this, road and not that road when something happens you know you make a conscious judgment not to do something this takes some time this prefrontal cortex takes some time to develop and usually develops by 21 years which is the reason why teenagers sometimes are not able to make good judgments and you know when parents say what were you thinking they weren't thinking because they they can't at that point that area has not really developed okay so it takes some time for it to develop and one, the way they found this out is that um, there, there used to be a guy called Phineas Gage, uh, and he worked in a railroad, and um, you know where they were blasting dynamite to lay down railway tracks. So one, the the tamping iron which they used those days to you know blast the dynamite, uh, he did it. It went off suddenly. It actually went through his uh, orbit and through his frontal, this prefrontal cortex. Imagine it went through like that. Okay, so here from his eye, it kind of went right through this way. And immediately after it went through, this guy started behaving very differently. He started having violent tantrums and, you know, became very unhygienic. And he survived that attack. I mean, that thing was still there and he survived it. And, um, you know, a mercurial temper, he would do odd things like, you know, pee in places that he would normally not have done that. And he had to leave that job and he joined the freak show. And then they realized that, you know, that's how one of the things they came to know. And if you all, if you all have seen the movie, One Who Flew Over the, Cuck One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, then that talks about this. So that's a really good movie. So this area is a really important area which deals with all of this. Uh, and then there is also an area there called the frontal eye field, which has something to do with controlling voluntary eye movement. Now, you've got to understand, I've put all of this in a very, very simple fashion. The brain is not so simple, okay? So there's lots of connections between different parts, but this is what I want you to know about the frontal lobe. Then we come to the parietal lobe. As we saw, there was that post-central gyrus behind the central sulcus. That's where sensory information was processed, so that's called the primary sensory area. The parietal lobe is also important for what is known as stereognosis, and what stereognosis is being able to uh, judge or tell if if you place an object in your hand and you have and your eyes are closed and if i pay, place a penny in your hand or i place a golf ball in your hand or i place a quarter in your hand without even seeing you would be able to tell me what it is right so just by feel of texture and shape you're able to tell what the object is. That's what is meant by stereognosis. So when people have parietal lobe problems, you place that thing. If, it, if they look at it, obviously, they'll be able to tell. But when they're not looking, they can't tell that by shape or texture. Then parietal lobe is also responsible for spatial relationship recognition. You know, parts of your body, how they are related to each other, um, or, you know, between left and right. Um, you know, how you can find a spatial relationship, not only of your body, but elsewhere, you know, like where you've parked your car. I mean, okay, in a really big parking lot, we all lose our way. So that's a different thing. But otherwise, you know, you, you kind of use landmarks and you know where it's parked or even say in your house, you know where the bathroom is. Or if you if you visit some place the first time, you may not know. But when you visit it a couple of times, you come to know the layout of that area. 
people with parietal lobe problems, they lose their way even in their own house. So they're not able to do that. They're not able to read maps. Um, you know, they don't recognize body relationships. So, for example, they completely disregard one side, uh, one side of their face. So when they, if a woman was applying makeup, she'd only apply makeup on one side. She'd completely forget the other side. You give her something to draw. Uh, she, you, for us, it's very difficult to understand. So if you do and give her an apple or something to draw, she'll only draw one half because she completely doesn't see the other side. Okay, it's not nothing wrong with vision. It's the, the perception in the brain. The parietal lobe and the insula as well um, have taste. So taste is a function is perceived in the insula as well as the parietal lobe. And then in the parietal lobe, most of this is in the temporal lobe, but in the parietal lobe, we have another area which is called Wernicke's area, or this is sensory speech. What is meant by sensory speech is that I am talking now, so I am using motor speech. But you're comprehending what I'm talking. So that is sensory speech. You see, when you read something, you have to first understand it. So for example, if I give you something to read and I say, then repeat, uh, read what you have read. When you read it, you have to first understand it, okay? So that understanding is what is known as sensory speech. And then when you say it aloud, when you actually articulate it, that is motor <laughs> speech. So what happens is when sensory speech goes, so you ask a person, what is your name? They will say, oh, it's fine today. The weather's real good. So see, they are talking normally, but they haven't really understood what you've asked them. And they answer, they know you're saying something to them. So their reply is completely off the walls, you know. So they, they kind of talk very jumbled sometimes. And that's known as a word salad because they kind of mix things up. They don't understand. So sensory speech means comprehending speech, okay, understanding speech. So these are some of the functions of the parietal lobe. Temporal lobe, this is one lobe maybe I thought of an easy way for you to remember. The temporal lobe is present here next to your temporal bone, which is close to your ears. So, you know, ears and so you can think hearing. Auditory means hearing. That's a function. The Wernicke's area is present here also and actually it's mainly in the temporal lobe. The nose, again, close to the ears. So the temporal lobe is also where smell is perceived. It's responsible for memory. There's a part called the hippocampus, memory and emotion. And also connected with a system known as the limbic system, which is responsible for certain... So the temporal lobe is connected to this limbic system, which is important for things like, you know, certain inborn traits, like women have a strong maternal instinct, um, just, you know, the libido in a person... Um, little things like that. So these are some of the inborn traits that we have. So that's all part of the temporal lobe. The occipital lobe is responsible for vision. So, you know, the way you can remember it is right behind the eye, straight behind the eyes are in front. The occipital lobe is in the back. So, you know, that's where vision is perceived. Associated visual functions are, for example, when you see something uh, as a child or even otherwise and it was red and it's dangerous and then you know next time to avoid it. So your brain kind of makes memories uh, and remembers that, you know, okay, you associate some things like um, something red, you, you know, maybe a hot stove. So you associate with that, right? So it's color and associate. So that's visual associated area. So these are showing those functional lobes. Uh, functional areas in the lobe. So pay attention to this picture of uh, these two slides real carefully. So you can see in the frontal primary cortex frontal area is the Broca's area up here. So I should have put this to the Broca up here. Look at the Wernicke's area, taste in insula and per up here. So this is a Really not going to go over it because all you're going to do is just look at this slide really carefully and you can kind of see. So look at this occipital area, vision, uh, uh, temporal area, look at it, hearing. So, um, you know, the important look, look at review.
cerebrum, the anterior or front and largest part of the brain, consisting of parts or hemispheres and serving to control voluntary movements and coordinate mental actions. Cerebellum, a large portion of the brain serving to coordinate voluntary movements, posture and balance in humans. Being in the back and below the cerebrum and consisting of two lateral lobes and the central lobe. Corpus Colossal. It connects the left and right cerebral hemispheres and facilitates interhemispheric communication. Brainstem. The portion of the brain that is continuous with the spinal cord. It controls reflexes and such essential internal mechanisms as respiration or breathing and heartbeat. Spinal cord, the thick column of nerve tissue that extends from the base of the brain about two-thirds of the way down the backbone. As part of the central nervous system, it carries impulses back and forth between the brain and other parts of the body through a network of nerves that extend out from it like branches. Sight area, the area responsible for vision. This is why a bang at the back of the head can make you see stars. Touch, this is responsible for touch, especially fingers and around the mouth. Motor area responsible for muscle coordination. Speech centre. This is obviously responsible for speech. It's pointing to the wernicke's Hearing centre. The area connected to your ears. Taste the area connected directly to your tongue. Balance and coordination connected to part of your ears are responsible for keeping your balance. So that kind of gave you quickly, some of the things were a bit off. The, it, when he said speech, he was talking about sensory speech. Remember it was in the parietal lobe, okay? Let's look at the white matter in the cerebrum. So corpus callosum was the largest tract. So you saw this is like a section taken, a coronal section down like that. So here is the corpus callosum in green, sorry. Here's the corpus callosum connecting one cerebral hemisphere with the one another and that how, that's how it helps transfer information. The other fibers, you see every area of the cerebral cortex has to talk to the other area, right? So you have, you can see little fibers connecting one area with another. For example, if you pricked some, yourself somewhere and you kind of withdraw your hand, you have to have information go to the sensory cortex from there to the motor cortex, then come down, right? So you can see how these fibers connect either with neighboring areas or you may have fibers which come all the way down and they go down into the spinal cord. So this is how fibers either connect with areas within the cerebral hemisphere or they connect with areas down in the spinal cord. Okay, so this is all white matter. It consists of axons which travel up and down between the various parts or between each other. So just as I told you, if I t get, talk to you and you understand, so when I talk to you, you first listen so you hear that, so it goes to the temporal lobe. 
From there, you understand it. So it goes to the Wernicke's area. And then if I ask you to read or speak out what I said, from there, it'll go to the Broca's area. And then you will talk out what I, if I say, repeat after me. So you understand how these areas will connect with one another. And it is through these axons or what, are, what is white matter. Now, here are the other parts of the brain. So this next area is called the diencephalon. It consists of these three parts called the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Notice how it tells you that the cavity is a third ventricle. So this area here is the thalamus. This area below it is the hypothalamus. And this little area here is the epithalamus. Notice how it shows it here. It, it has this gland called the pineal gland. These are the various function these are the various functions of the these three areas. The thalamus is the main sensory relay station. You will see when we do the spinal cord, when we do the peripheral nervous system next time, what is meant by this? That means all the general sensations we talked of, remember the pinch touch, all of that, they come through the spinal cord. They first will go and have a synapse at the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, actually, they will go and they will uh, relay into that post-central gyrus or parietal lobe. Okay, so that's what is meant by main sensory relay. Relay means a synapse occurs here. Then the thalamus also has uh, parts which are called geniculate bodies. So these are relay centers for auditory and visual pathway. Relay centers means that's where synapses occur. So any reflexes which have to do with auditory pathway, auditory means hearing or visual pathway, uh, that's synapses there. I'm afraid this is something that you just have to memorize. There's a lot more to it, uh, which really goes into neuroanatomy, which I don't want to go through, so I just told you that. So that's one of the functions. It's also connected, the thalamus, to many areas in the brain, and it kind of mediates activities. It kind of gets information from the spinal cord, sends information to the cerebral cortex, and it kind of controls and makes sure that everything is moderated and working well. Hypothalamus, the word hypo means below. So below the thalamus is this hypothalamus. This is the area which is the body thermostat. I don't know how many of you remember when we did the uh, first lecture introduction and we were talking about sweating and how the body maintains homeostasis and how the hypothalamus senses that your body temperature goes up. So that's this is what we were talking about at that time. So it's the body thermostat. It senses whether your body temperature is going up or down and will automatically make sure that some changes take place so that your temperature comes back to normal. So for example, if you feel very hot, you start sweating. That's because the hypothalamus sends impulses. If you feel cold, you shiver. Again, the hypothalamus is sending impulses. It controls thirst, your sleep-wake cycle, controls a lot of autonomic and visceral activity for because it is related to the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, you know, how your gastrointestinal tract behaves, how your emotions behave, um, you know, all of that. So it, it controls that. Controls endocrine functions because it actually controls the pituitary gland. So it controls the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland produces a lot of hormones which bring about changes in your body. So this is the endocrine function. It's often, this is actually the master gland. The pituitary used to be called master, but this one is the master because it actually sits on top of the pituitary, which is here, and it tells it, it stimulates it or inhibits it and you know then the pituitary can act. It also controls emotions and biological rhythms, you know, like sleep-wake cycles, um, other rhythms in your body. So it's important for controlling that. This epithalamus, this area here, has this little gland called the pineal gland. The pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, which you may know. Some of you, it's also sold in, um, you know, various stores and people take it when they're not able to sleep. This melatonin is responsible for sleep-wake cycle. In your body, melatonin is produced when it's dark. That's why you go to sleep when it's dark. And the moment light comes, then, you know, you wake up, okay? So it regulates your sleep-wake cycle. Below the diencephalon, we have the brainstem. The brainstem is made up of these three parts, the midbrain, pons, and medulla. So you must know that. 
most of the cranial nerves arrive arise from the brain stem from cranial nerve 3rd to 12 there are 12 cranial nerves 3rd to 12 arise from here so what about the first two the first and the second they arise from the cerebrum so majority of the cranial nerves arise from here the midbrain so let's describe the first of the brain stem structures the midbrain its cavity is what is called the aqueduct or cerebral aqueduct it's got various parts this like two columns that you see here these two columns are what are called crust cerebri of the midbrain okay they transmit motor fibers which are coming down from the cerebrum and going all the way to the spinal cord it has little structures which we'll see in the next slide rounded structures which are known as colliculi and they are relay centers for auditory and visual just as we looked in the thalamus these structures have have synapses which are to do with hearing and vision so visual pathway so we said most of the brain or cranial nerves arise from the brain stem so you must know which cranial nerves are related to which part of the brain so cranial nerves 3rd and 4th are related to the midbrain and all of the brain stem is connected to the cerebellum because it sends information to the cerebellum and also receives information so it's connected through the cerebellum through something known as superior cerebellar peduncle the word peduncle means like a thick column okay if you forget which cerebellar peduncle it doesn't matter but imagine you have a superior a middle and an inferior the midbrain is on top the pons is below and the medulla is the lowest so obviously superior middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles are little columns which connect the brain stem to the cerebellum midbrain is connected through the superior cerebellar peduncle what i want you to know is it's connected to the cerebellum most important okay the other structures of the brain stem pons and medulla their cavity is the fourth ventricle so in the pons get used to these roman numerals you will find that cranial nerves are written in roman numerals okay so cranial nerve 5 to 8 arise from the pons so 5 to 8 arise from the pons the pons is connected to the motor cortex that means to the cerebrum and also to the cerebellum so it helps to relay information from both areas so it kind of helps to coordinate that and in the pons there is this vital respiratory center so if the brain stem is damaged especially the pons respiration becomes a big problem the next so here was the midbrain so here is the pons and here is the medulla and here you can see this midbrain is connected to the cerebellum by the superior cerebellar peduncle the pons is by the middle cerebellar peduncle and the mid uh, in medulla by the inferior cerebellar peduncle just remember that the brain stem is connected to the cerebellum okay in the up here i told you that the midbrain had something called colliculi you can't see it at this in this picture but when we turn it around when we look at the brain stem from the side here can you see these swellings these are what are known as colliculi and they were to do with visual and auditory pathways how about the medulla the medulla connects the cerebral cortex with the spinal cord there are motor fibers remember we said the cerebral cortex controls the opposite side of the body or contralateral side so if you remember when i was drawing suppose this is one cerebral cortex remember fibers come down like this and i showed you they they kind of go to the opposite side right they cross over this crossing over actually happens in the medulla so that is what is meant by crossing of descending tracks these tracks of fibers are coming down they cross over at the level of the medulla that's how one side can control the opposite side of the body nerves 9 to 12 arise from the 9 to 12 arise from the medulla and it contains vital respiratory and cardiac centers vital centers so again when you know somebody is hung for example what happens is when hanging takes place 
the dense of the axis vertebra actually presses against these vital centers and that's how the person sort of dies. So this is just showing you these connections of the brain stem. So we've been talking how the brain stem is connected to the cortex, how it's connected to the cerebellum. So these are these are fibers. So look, just look at this picture here. Here it just shows you a single axon. But in your body, there's not just one axon carrying pain and temperature, right? From all over your body, pain, temperature, touch, pressure, sensory impulses go up to the brain. So they keep joining and when they join up, these axons become a bundle which is called a tract. So notice how some are present here, some join higher up. So they're all going towards the brain. And some of these fibers also help to connect the pons, the midbrain and the medulla to the cerebellum. So I'm just showing you these areas. So these are tracks which are going to the brain. So these are known as sensory or ascending tracks because they travel up. From the pre-central gyrus, remember the motor area in the frontal cortex, impulses will travel down so that they will influence muscle. So they are called descending or motor tracks. So notice how they come down. So they are on this side. And when they come down, see how they are crossing over here. And then they come to the other side. So that's how injury on this side will damage the deficit or the, the what will be seen will be on the opposite side or contralateral side of the body. Okay, so same for motor and sensory. It's always the contralateral side which is affected. Let's look at cerebellum. The cerebellum is known as little brain. It's called the little brain. It's much smaller than the cerebral cortex. This is different from the cerebral cortex. It's a, it controls the same side of the body. Controlling the same side is the word used is ipsilateral. So if this, cere if this was the right side of the cerebellum, if this was damaged, you would see the effect on the right side of the body. When you take a section of the cerebellum, just like the brain, um, the cerebral hemisphere, the gray matter is on the outside. So look at this. This is called the cerebellar cortex. And the white matter is in the center. But the white matter kind of goes in and it looks, can you see, it looks a little bit like a tree. So this tree-like pattern is known as the arbor vitae pattern of white matter. And this is seen specifically in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is con connected to the cerebrum. The cerebral hemispheres, it's connected to the brain stem and the spinal cord. So you can see all these connections. Because of this, its function is to make sure that you, your posture, your gait, your muscle tone, all that is controlled well. You know, like the very fact that you can stand erect when you walk, you walk properly, you're not kind of walking on a broad base, you're walking properly, you're swinging your hands properly, your muscle tone. When you go to pick, pick something up, for example, you go and pick it up and you, you know, do this. You kind of don't go and pick up anything in a jerky fashion or don't just pick it up and do that, right? All of this is controlled really beautifully. So this kind of coordinated movement is the effect of the cerebellum. So it coordinates skeletal movements. So if there was any problem in the cerebellum, your movements wouldn't be coordinated. So if somebody had to go pick, you tell, told them to, let's say, touch their nose. Normally, you and I can touch our nose with our fingers closed, uh, with our eyes closed or open. We can touch our nose real easily, right? Someone with cerebellar problems would, have a, would not be able to do that. Even with the eyes open or closed, when they come to touch their nose, their finger will keep jerking all over the place like this, and this is how they will go. So because the coordination doesn't occur. So cerebellum is very important for coordination and maintaining posture, gait, and balance. Yes. Pardon? No, cere that cerebral palsy is a different thing. That's a different kind of disease. That's a movement disorder. Uh, al alcohol affects a lot of uh, areas and um, it, it kind of affects the inhibiting center. So they've gone and um, affects balance in a different way. Okay. Let's look at the blood supply of the brain. So its brain needs a very, very good supply. So two main arteries supply the brain, the vertebral and internal carotid. So together it's called the vertebrocarotid system. 
And what they do is, these two arteries, notice they form a little circle up here. So you don't have to know the details of the circle. You can see they're forming a little circle. Here's the internal carotid of one side and of the other. And the vertebral here, notice how they join and they come up. And you can see this little circle formed. This circle is known as the circle of Willis. The importance is if one artery is blocked, blood can reroute itself and go the other way. So the brain is always supplied with blood. This area is also prone to aneurysms. Aneurysms are when blood vessels are dilated, when the wall of a blood vessel is dilated. Imagine this is the normal blood vessel when its wall is dilated like this. This is called an aneurysm. You've all heard of aortic aneurysm. There's so many uh, you know, ads in the paper asking you to get tested for that. So in this uh, circle of Willis, you find little aneurysm which look like berries. So the, these are known as berry aneurysms. Okay, so these are found, you know, fairly frequently, maybe 10% of the population or something. I may be wrong there, but, you know, it's not uncommon to find them. So therefore, whenever an aneurysm, which is a dilation of the blood vessel wall, um, that's a weak spot. They can rupture and they can cause strokes. Okay, so you're always worried about that. Let's look at the spinal cord now. So we're done with the medulla. So medulla continues as the spinal cord. So here are some really important facts about the spinal cord. So it begins where the medulla ends, which is the medulla ends at the foramen magnum. So spinal cord begins there. And it doesn't extend throughout the entire length of the vertebral canal. Remember, your vertebral canal goes all the way till the coccyx. The spinal cord ends at the level of L1 and L2, between L1 and L2 vertebra. From there on, what happens is you still have nerves which have to come out through the intervertebral foramina, right? The nerves are still present. Those nerve roots will still be present in the subarachnoid space because like the brain, the spinal cord is also surrounded by meninges. So it also has the subarachnoid space surrounding it. And the subarachnoid space extends till the sacral two vertebra. So these are some important levels for you to understand. Outside of the dura is a space called extradural space or epidural space. This has fat and venous sinuses. Remember in the brain also you had a space which was outside the dura meta. That, so here we have that. This, this has fat and venous sinuses. Where the spinal cord ends in the subarachnoid space, it is at this point where it ends, this area is conical in shape. It's called the conus medullaris. And from here, a thin filament starts down and goes and attaches to the back of the coccyx. This thin filament is known as phylum terminal or terminal filament. So this is the phylum terminal or term Think of it as terminal filament. It's just a little piece of nervous tissue with pia mater. So the cord ends at L between L1 and L2. But from here on, the nerve fibers still have to come out, which, uh, you know, for example, sacral nerves will pass out through the sacral intervertebral foramen or lumbar nerves will pass out through the lumbar intervertebral foramen. So you will still see the sheaf of nerve fibers in the subarachnoid space. So it looks like a little tuft of hair like a horse's tail. So this sheaf of nerve fibers is known as corda equina. The word corda means tail, equina means horse. So it looks like a horse's tail. The spinal cord has is enlarged. So when it comes down from the foramen magnum all the way to the L1 vertebra, in the cervical region and in the lumbar region, it's enlarged because from there nerves go to the upper limb and the lower limb. So you have more muscle there, so you need more neurons, so it's enlarged in those two areas, cervical and lumbar regions, to supply muscles of the upper limb and lower limb, for muscles of the upper and the lower limb. So that's why you have the spinal cord is a little bit enlarged in those areas. We'll see it in the picture, next picture. We had 33 vertebrae but we have only 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So when we do the peripheral nervous system, we'll talk how the nerves are distributed. For now, you remember that we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves and they are attached to the spinal cord by two prongs. Those prongs are known as roots. 
They are called dorsal and ventral roots. And these spinal nerves come out through the intervertebral foramina. Now you've all heard of a spinal tap or what is also known as a lumbar puncture. So when you want to do a lumbar puncture, the main purpose is to either withdraw cerebrospinal fluid or women might, during labor, you might have a, what is called a spinal anesthetic pushed into the a subarachnoid space so that it will uh, anesthetize all those roots over there. You have to do this below the level of L2 vertebra because the cord ends at L1 and L2. So if you do it above, you can hit the cord. If you do it below, these nerve fibers are very thin. So when you put your needle through, the nerve fibers kind of get out of the way so they don't get affected. Okay, so lumbar <coughs> puncture is always done below L2 vertebra, lumbar 2 vertebra. So here, let's look at the picture. So here, this is a cut section of the spinal cord. So look at all the, these are all the meninges which surround it. This outer layer is dura. This green layer is arachnoid. And then firmly attached to the spinal cord is the pia mater. In between the arachnoid and the pia, this space is the subarachnoid space, which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And this is the space outside. So this area here, which is called the ec extra or also known as epidural space or also called the extra dural space. This space is the one which is between the dura mater and the bone, the vertebral canal, the bone of the vertebral canal. So this is the one which is filled with fat and you can see with veins like I mentioned in that slide. Okay, you can see the fat and the veins here. And here, let's look at the cord. So look at the cord lying in the vertebral canal. This cord ends here. See this? This is the point where it ends. And, oops. So this is the point where it ends. And this point is where it's called the conus medullaris. And below the conus medullaris, notice this sheaf of nerve fibers, which looks like a horse's tail called corda equina. Coming from the conus medullaris is this thin green uh, filament shown in green, which is the phylum terminale. It comes all the way down and attaches to the cox. Of nerve these pull down and get out through the lumbar intervertebral foramen. See the sacral nerves will travel down and get through the sacral intervertebral foramen. That's why you have that sheaf. Notice also in the cervical region and in the lumbar region, see how the cord is enlarged a little bit over here and here, and that is for supply of the limbs. And when you look at these spinal nerves, which are coming out through the intervertebral foramen, the intervertebral foramen is somewhere here. So that's where the intervertebral foramen is. See how these nerves are attached to the cord by two roots. See this root here, this is the dorsal root, this root here is the ventral root. So the nerve, actually these nerves come and get attached to the cord by two roots. So notice here, dorsal and there'll be a ventral root here, okay? So this is how the nerves are attached because we'll see that sensory impulses will go one way, motor impulses will come out another way. This is the spinal nerve. This part here is the nerve. And this is how it is attached. This part is the dorsal root. This part is the ventral root. Okay? D and V stand for dorsal and ventral root. This shows you how you do a lumbar puncture. So you have to do it below L2. So that when you go below L2, what you're seeing, like here they're showing you a picture between L4 and L5. So you only see the nerves. They are very thin, so you, the chances of hitting them are few. They'll move out of the way and you can withdraw your fluid and then inject anesthetic fluid if needed or if not needed, you just withdraw the CSF, okay? Oh, yes, with any any uh, any procedure, things can go wrong. I mean, sometimes people may have extreme bleeding uh, beyond that. You know, you might hit a, a vein and you can have problems. But most of the time it goes well. You never do it above L2 because you then you will definitely hit the cord. And if you hit the cord, does that look paralyzed you? You could, you could, yeah. Now, just as we saw the brain, when we take a section of the spinal cord, you will see certain structures. 
So I'm not going to go through this because this is just, I'm going, just going to be reading this out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of these things that you will see in the spinal cord, okay? So you can just see these things. You have a gray matter in the center. You have white matter along the periphery. Again, look at this repetition. Spinal nerves are correct, connected by dorsal and ventral roots. Uh, so we'll see this in the picture and I'll show you what all is described here. So look here. So here when we look at the spinal cord, so this is the spinal cord. And when you take a look at the spinal cord, see if you look here, notice the gray matter is in the center. It's kind of H-shaped. The white matter is in the periphery, okay? The central canal is present here, right? This central area here at the back, so just as we saw those little fissures, so notice here you have a ventral median fissure and a dorsal median sulcus. So this part here, this area here is what is called the dorsal sulcus. And this here is the ventral fissure. You don't have to kind of concern yourself with, I, I think it's just in a waste of brain power trying to remember whether the sulcus is in the back or the sul fissure is in front. Just understand that when you draw the spinal cord, notice that there is a, a little sort of, sulcus here and a sulcus here. Just one is called a fissure, one is called a sulcus, okay? Dividing the cord into right and left side. So, and notice how the gray matter is present here in the center. It's kind of H-shaped. Um, the central canal is here in the center. This gray matter, if you look at it, can you notice the gray matter is kind of projected on top? It's projected up here. These are called horns. You know, they, when we draw them, these are known as horns. So if I draw it like this, I'll draw the gray matter this way. Okay. This part here is known as the dorsal horn. So this is the dorsal horn. This area here is called the ventral horn. Okay. See that? Dorsal horn and ventral horn. And... Let me go back and see. So you have dorsal horn, ventral horn, and we also have lateral uh, horns which are present only in certain areas. So for now, these little horns which you can see here, only in the thoracic and upper lumbar regions and in the sacral regions. When we do next time, when we talk of autonomic nervous system, I'll be describing them. These lateral horns are not present everywhere in the spinal cord, only in the thoracic. They are connected to the autonomic nervous system. So they are present only in the thoracic, upper lumbar, and some sacral segments. These, because it is gray matter, these horns contain gray matter. They therefore have multipolar neurons. Remember, multipolar neurons were present in the central nervous system. Then... Here you notice, this is the spinal cord. So can you see that you get these two roots? This is the ventral root. This is the dorsal root. So these are the two roots. Notice these two roots join up and they form the spinal nerve. So that's how the spinal nerve is attached to the spinal cord by a dorsal root. And it's attached to, by the, to the spinal cord by a ventral root. The reason you have these two separate roots is because the kind of impulses that either go to the spinal cord or come from the spinal cord travel in these roots. So these roots carry one specific type of impulse, either sensory or motor. So here notice also with the dorsal root, you have this dorsal root ganglion. And I don't know if you remember, we did the types of neurons. You remember there was something called the pseudo unipolar neuron? Even if you don't remember where it was present, you definitely remember the pseudo-unipolar neuron, right? Which was like this, isn't it? So see this, this is a pseudo-unipolar neuron and this is present in the dorsal root ganglion. Notice what it says, dorsal root is the sensory root. Notice what it says, ventral root is the motor root. That means sensory neurons will enter into the spinal cord. All neurons carrying sensory impulses will enter via the dorsal root. All motor impulses which exit the spinal cord, remember motor meaning starting from the central nervous system going to the periphery. That was the definition of motor. So it begins here in the ventral horn, the motor impulse. 
it passes out through the ventral root and gets into the spinal nerve so in the spinal nerve can you see that impulses are going together both in and out right but when it comes to the roots they diverge sensory go one way motor are present in another can you understand that so very important we will be repeating this when we do the peripheral nervous system so what what I, why i want you to pay attention to the picture is that since when we repeat you should understand a spinal nerve is connected to the spinal cord by two roots the spinal nerve carries impulses sensory impulses to the spinal cord which is part of the central nervous system <laughs> the spinal nerve also carries motor impulses from the central nervous system to the muscle remember motor impulses went to muscle so both kind of impulses were traveling in the spinal nerve but when they near the spinal cord the impulses have to branch ways the the sensory go in the dorsal root and they have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglia the ventral root on the other hand has motor impulses which began in the gray matter and it came out like this so the cell body is in the central nervous system the axons come out and then they join the spinal nerve okay so have you understood how these roots connect to the spinal cord we will be repeating this when we do the spinal nerve in the peripheral nervous system then when you look at the section of i know it is a lot i know it's a lot it's a bit heavy but i i believe me if you keep uh, if you keep reading and we will be repeating a lot of it when we do the peripheral nervous system um i don't want to delay this into you know making four videos for it so that's why i'm kind of going through that so that we can begin peripheral nervous system on uh, wednesday and then you know kind of cement some of these concepts so all this while we were talking about the gray matter so now when we look at the white matter so all this area this area is all called white matter right it just happens to be divided again don't get confused with certain terms which are thrown in so you can see there's an area of white matter posterior there's an area of white matter lateral and there's an area of white matter anterior can you see that it's all white matter so these three areas have just been given names instead of calling them simple columns they call them funiculi okay in this white matter is where tracts are present tracts remember were axons which were going up and down between the brain and the spinal cord so imagine if a neuron came here and instead of doing this it wanted to go all the way to the brain what it would do is it would may synapse here and an axon will come and it will travel like that so it will travel in the white matter or maybe from the precentral gyrus an impulse was traveling down it came here and then synapsed here so can you see you have axons present in the white matter so those collection of axons is what is known as tracts okay the tracts which go up to the brain are ascending because they're going up the tracts which come down are descending because they're coming down ascending remember means sensory because it's going to the brain descending means motor because it's coming down from the brain so that's all that this is saying so in the white matter it's peripheral there are three columns seen anterior middle and posterior ascending and descending tracks are seen in the white matter these tracks have specific locations like a tract carrying pain will pre be present in one area tract carrying temperature will be present in one area ascending tracks carry information to the brain and the, they carry sensory information this is like touch temperature pressure posture and based on their names you can understand where the information is going so spinothalamic what does it tell you where is it going spinal. spinal cord to the thalamus spino cerebellar from spinal cord to cerebellum so do you understand it will be ascending because if it's going from spinal cord to thalamus thalamus is higher up so it's traveling up can you see that descending tracks bring information from the brain and our motor look at the name cortico spinal from the cortex to the spinal cord cortico nuclear in the brain stem you have nuclei so it's going from cortex to the nuclei vestibulo spinal rubro spinal these are all different areas they are all nuclei up in the cortex and they're coming to the spinal cord so they're traveling down so these are you know different names so the kind of question you would get would be something like 
corticospinal tract is going from where to where, what kind of fibers will it carry? So you know that it's going from the cortex to the spinal cord. It's a descending tract, so it is going to carry motor fibers, right? Spinothalamic, where is it going? From spinal cord to thalamus, means it's going from below upwards. It's climbing up, ascending. Remember, ascending tracts are always sensory. Motor tracts, uh, descending tracts are always motor. So that's why this is very important to understand. Because that tells you the definition. Remember, sensory information went to the brain. So it has to travel up to go to the brain. Motor information went from the central nervous system out. So it has to come down. Okay, so this is very, very important to understand. So here, if you look, this is just showing you the same picture we saw earlier. Look how ascending tracks, look at the arrow going up. Look at descending tracks coming down. Okay, they both are present in the white matter. So they just kind of share the same space. And these, if you were to see these tracks, if you take a section of the cord and you kind of, we don't, in, you can't, you know, when you take a section of the spinal cord, it's not like you're going to see red and blue, sort of little, very circumscribed areas. These are things we draw on our ourselves. But this is about the area where you might have a corticospinal descending tract. This is about the area where you may have a spinothalamic tract. So just showing you the blue is ascending and the red are descending. And notice how they share the white matter, okay, the space. And this is just showing you how fibers travel in an upward direction, the ascending fibers. Look at downward fibers, how they come and how they are crossing and they come down. So this is an ascending tract and like spinothalamic going up from spinal cord to thalamus. This is called corticospinal, coming down from cortex to the spinal cord. So if you just kind of look at the word, it doesn't get that overwhelming, okay? I know you're laughing, but it, it will. You, you all will get it. Uh, these are just some little um, lesions of the spinal cord. Obviously, if your sensory tracts are gone, you would lose the, that area. Would, you would not feel any sensation. That loss of sensation is called paresthesia. If, on the other hand, motor tracts are involved, if there's damage to motor tracts, the muscle will get para paralyzed, and that's when you'll have paralysis. You've all heard of diseases like polio. ALS is what is called amyotropic lateral sclerosis, or you may know of it as Lou Gehrig's disease. This is where motor neurons are affected, and in these people, muscles are paralyzed. So everything else is normal, but muscles are paralyzed. And some diseases like multiple sclerosis affect both, all tracts, so they don't stick with one. So they affect motor as well as sensory tracts, so both are affected. So if motor tracts are affected, the person has paralysis. If sensory tracts are affected, they have loss of sensation from that area. So, you know, you can see that it can be quite a debilitating disease, okay? This is more out of interest, general interest, just to tell you what functions are lost and how you can sort of, relate them to things that you hear in everyday life, okay? So please do read all of this 